Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Now, as we enter the final week of the US election, the expected climax to long buried animosities is strikingly at hand. It is unlikely to be brief or decisive. The internal convulsions of the US, however, are one thing, but the implosion of social trust in the US is radiating out and its effects are radiating out across the globe. If the imprecision of our times compounded by the virus is making us nervous and tense, it may be because we perceive that a way of life, a way of economics too, is coming to its end. Distrust is spreading today faster than the coronavirus. What has changed inside the US of A? How did the internal situation affect its influence and influence in the world? Both sides, the GOP and the Dems, are now imagining a clash and the violence and the turmoil to come. And not only imagining it, the public are buying weapons furiously. The prerequisites for conflict thus are in place. Each imagines the other as darkly threatening their way of life. That is the catchphrase, your utopia, my dystopia. And what is to come? A new poll raises the specter of a second civil war in the United States of America. Amid warnings, extremists are more willing to resort to violence. We can, um, well, uh, to discuss the real crisis in the US today and the implications of a weakened structure and fabric across the country and a prognosis of what yet to come, we will launch this first edition of the International Forum for Responsible Dialogue discussion platform, and I'm Zainab al Safar. Allow me to welcome the two A's, Alexander Dugan and Alistair Crook. The right. A scorers in terms of their philosophical attributes and intelligent, prudent, in-depth prognosis and analysis. Of course, Alexander Dugan is the influential Russian philosopher, political analyst, theorist, strategist, and founder of the fourth political theory. Alexander, Al Alistair Crook, sorry, is a British diplomat, founder and director of Conflicts Forum and former ranking figure in European Union diplomacy. Uh, dear guests, welcome to this discussion and feel free to jump in for comment at your convenience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Always welcome. Well, to start with Professor Dugan, you believe that the result of the American elections is to change decisively the world. In this eschatological time, everything is going very well according to the plan that inspires great expectations. What expectations are you referring to uh, in this sense, Dr. Dugan? So I think that my, the world we are living in, it's absolutely abnormal, not because of COVID, not because of uh, United States, not because of the evident and obvious decline of the West uh, that is incapable, simply incapable to lead the world. Be they try still to impose on us their values, but don't, uh, they are not sure anymore that these values uh, uh, they need to defend. So they don't believe in them anymore. So that is the high, highest, uh, highest level of hypocrisy in the world and a kind of uh, loss of the direction. So uh, the, uh, the, the West that was considered to be the uh, main driver of, of, of the history now is in very bad situation. And that is not just, just uh, momentarily. It is something, the deep crisis of the West. On one hand, that means the approaching of the catastrophe. That means catastrophe because the uh, uh, world order with you is cracking, is falling apart. But of, uh, I considered always being traditionalist, Christian, Orthodox, that modernity is abnormality from the very beginning. 
And so the crisis is the crisis of the crisis. That's the end of the end. That is not uh, something when happy and just uh, and good uh, civilization and society is approaching to some uh, something catastrophic. Rather, the catastrophic, abnormal, anti-human uh, society in this Western um, uh, modernity, not the West uh, in, in, in such, because the West is the huge culture, Greek or Roman, very ancient and very, uh, very important, but modernity has destroyed almost all from this great Western heritage. Uh, and now we are approaching to this, the, the uh, last stage of this destruction. And my hope is what, what will come uh, after the flood. Not so uh, après de l'ougenou, after the flood uh, um, uh, ourselves, we will come after. So I think that is the end of the, of the big uh, crisis that is approaching and the civil war and the COVID uh, and a total impossibility to deal with such a threat, such a challenge by global global system. All these signs are the signs of the end, but that is not the end of the world, I, I hope. That is the, the end of this perverted reality that was, uh, uh, that was considered to be only way, Western liberal globalist way of life. We need alternative, and that is the right moment to affirm this alternative, uh, inspiring in other culture, in other tradition, in uh, religions, in, the, in antiquity, in the past, and in the future. Because I, uh, I believe in utopia. I don't think that we should be always too, uh, too, uh, uh, too close to the reality. We need to have dreams, we need to have horizons, uh, but we need to think better on this utopia. It should be based on spirit, on the religion, on the transcendence, uh, on the human core and dignity, and not on this material world that is approaching to its end. Before I jump into Alistair to ask about his comment regarding uh, this, um, I would like to understand how is this, Dr. Dugan, translated in the US of A today? So I, I think um, in, in, in US now, we are assisting a fight between two poles that is not uh, capitalism against socialism, not, for example, uh, uh, liberalism against illiberalism. That is the inner split of the liberal democracy itself, because there is new democracy represented by Biden, but that is based on the minorities, by LGBT+, plus, uh, by uh, techno-centered um, uh, science, uh, or uh, uh, humanism+, plus, and artificial intelligence. That is post-liberalism on one uh, hand or new understanding of liberalism and democracy and, and the uh, traditional democracy, uh, traditional American liberal democracy with the defense of some values as families, individuals, and many other things. And they are represented by two parties, by two uh, competing parties fighting against each other. And there is geopolitics because the heartland is in favor of old understanding of uh, liberal democracy. And the uh, Rimland or boss, uh, East Coast and West Coast boss are in hand of the uh, liberal, neoliberal, neo-democrats. So that is ideological fight. For the first time, maybe from the civil war, the election means ideological fight. And that is the split inside of American identity, inside of American society, inside of American political structure, inside of American ideology, inside of American mind. And that is a uh, uh, huge, uh, that it will have huge impact on all of us because we are used to regard America as leader and they are still leader, but that is schizophrenic uh, leader, the leader with split on consciousness. It's very dangerous, but that is one of the main, main new aspect of the present situation, present moment. Uh, Alistair, how far do you agree with uh, what uh, Professor Dugan has just uh, talked about, his approach, the way he eyes the matter, 
um, uh, the highest level of hypocrisy and loss of direction and what will come after the flood? Uh, is it the end of the bleak crisis? Uh, is the end approaching, as Professor Dugan said, uh, is the end uh, of the perverted reality just uh, a footstep away? Um, what do you think about that? Before I jump to my first question to you, uh, Ambassador Crook. Um, I, I agree in the general thrust of what um, uh, Professor Dugan has just said, but mm -hmm. I would cast it slightly differently because um, it, yes, in a sense, it's ideological, but actually it's much more than that. It's about a culture war. It's about the American civil war. It's about deep divisions that have always existed in American society and are now bubbling up. In a sense, this is the next chapter to the American civil war. And it is an existential conflict. On the one hand, you don't have, if you like, on the other side, it's not about democracy or liberty or any of those values. We're talking really of, about a, a form of cultural Bolshevism uh, that is taking place with some of the more extreme woke members of America's society. Uh, this is um, a change that's taking place within generations and a generation. If you go to the millennials, they believed in these values still believed that they'd been corrupted, believed they'd been misused, that there was no democracy, no liberalism. But with some of this younger uh, generation, they just believe uh, that America is irredeemably racist, oppressive, and that its very principles upon which it's founded are the oppression and the racism is embedded in that. I mean, they're calling really for the system to be burnt down. So in a sense, it's, it's beyond politics. We're talking about something. And we're talking also about two peoples who really are agreed um, in their own communities that the other side is intolerable, that it's the end for them. If the other party wins, we are finished culturally. That they will, the principles on which America was founded, the foundational ideas are gone and will be overthrown um, by whoever comes in. And the other side believes the same. And the other side is also going to, um, uh, believes that they must do anything to stop the other side winning. So it's going to be um, uh, an, really an existential conflict in which both sides believe the other is going to cheat I'm not even sure we're going to have, and we certainly won't probably have, it's very unlikely we'll have a president on the 3rd of November. Um, there will be immediately legal contestations of mail votes. It will go on. Each side has hundreds of lawyers already deputized to go around the 50 states challenging the outcome. Mm -hmm. I'm not even sure it will stop there. It might end up in Congress which it has happened before in the 1860s, where- Supreme Court, the electoral uh, okay. college, and then to the Congress, and then- And then, then yeah. they, the, in the past, they had to just decide it on a ballot there. So mm -hmm. it's got, it's, and what is the implications for that? And you said, you know, what does it mean? I think, first of all, you know, it's already deadlocked. And actually what we're talking about is really, you know, in targeting, in targeting Trump, whom they loathe so much, one section, one half of the American population, actually they're killing the United States. They're targeting Trump, but they're going to end up killing the United States uh, yes. in, in, in this process and destroy it. And it will, um, if you like, deconstruct. Um, that, in that. that said, Alistair, Alex Theodoritz, uh, an associate professor of political science at the University of Massachusetts uh, Amherst has studied the country's growing divide and he says, quote, my research and work by others shows that most partisans are willing to metaphorically dehumanize those from the other party and that this dehumanization predicts greater tolerance for partisan violence. Is America? on the brink 
and this is a question posed by many today. Is America on the brink of a civil war as half the country expect violence over election day fraud? And how will Alistair and educated liberal society respond to such violence? Uh, well, the short answer is going to be yes, not a civil war, but a new chapter in an ongoing civil war that was never resolved in 1860 and still isn't resolved in America, pitting certain states against other states' values against other values. But I think what is more important is the Manichaeanism that is present in the United States today. Each side sees the other, not as an ideological opponent, but as evil. And you recall even the presidential candidates talk about light versus dark, about the complete evil of the other side. I mean, this is, we are going into really, you know, deep territory when we cast um, the other side as completely evil, an evil that is, um, if you like, a cosmic evil that must be overcome at any cost and do whatever is necessary to overcome it. And of course, I think this is you know, dangerous. In this last period, there's been a huge run on the gun stores. There's no ammunition available in the United States because all of it's bought. And for me, the most interesting statistic in that is not that Americans are uh, have got lots of guns, they've always had that. But the interesting statistic is that nearly half of these weapons are being bought by women. And mm -hmm. I understand when women buy guns, it's to protect they use the them. house. They use them and it's to protect their children and their home. It's not to go out and parade on the street and look sort of masculine with a uniform on and a big gun over their shoulder. This is serious. People are seriously frightened when so many women are buying these guns. Uh, mm -hmm. not just the men. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Dugan, how do you see, in which prism do you see this kind of, uh, you know, rush by the people? And um, particularly as uh, uh, Ambassador Crook said that, the rush of women to militarize and to arm themselves with extra arms and weapons. It could be a very interesting phenomenon, very interesting, but it is not simple. Uh, I think that we are living inside a very important uh, gender shift, anthropological shift, because the civilization, the humanity was led by men, by patriarchy. And uh, in spite of some kind of interpretation of liberal interpretation, postmodernist interpretation of feminism, there is some natural, natural demand to, 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 re, to, to reconsider the role of the women uh, in the history. It is not from the left, from the liberalism. That is, could be as well from the right and uh, or from the traditional point of view, because there were many archetypes of femininity, uh, of the uh, wisdom, of the of, of power, of the bravery, of the heroism, as well in the classical tradition on the side of the women. And I think this heroic aspect of the femininity, we uh, sometimes sometime miss, may, we, we, we forget that. But uh, 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 the women can uh, be more brave than the men, and they are serious. I agree with uh, Alas uh, Lester that they are serious when they uh, when they buy the gun. It's not uh, to to just to show themselves uh, her, uh, themselves. It is for use it, and I think that is kind of. Uh, not revenge, it is not just a demand of recognition, uh, it is something uh, something different, and something very, very profound, something very, very deep in that, in that re-evaluation of, of, of this uh, possibility of, of, of the womanhood. So I think, and that doesn't depend from the liberalism, the liberals only give to it, I think, reduced interpretation and the possible uh, re, uh, re in inventing the uh, femininity could be as well uh, to, could go in different directions. So I am not against that and that I think that that is something uh, that is objective in some way, but we need to fight for interpretation 
And uh, that is absolutely wrong to think that all the women or majority of women are for Democrats from new dem liberalism, for these uh, coastal, coastal oligarchs uh, or post-human humanist elite of America, uh, United States. There is the huge amount of, of the traditional woman, uh, women, the women as such, who, who wants to defend not only their you know, femininity, but as well the children, the children. families, mm -hmm. and that is very important. So in both cases, the, the women are mobilized on both camps. It is not just an arm or argument of the uh, ultra-liberals and Democrats, because uh, there is the support of traditional way of life, of traditional um, values on the on the side of the women. So we need, we shouldn't fall in the trap to say, oh, all the all the claims of the modern, modern women to to play more important role in the society is uh, wrong a priori. It is not so. It is just manipulation and instrumentalization. And I think. Uh, the women uh, will uh, uh, participate actively in the decision of the future of humanity, more actively than before. Right. Um, that said, uh, Dr. Dugan, you are considered as one of the most dangerous philosophers um, in the world to the extent that your ideas are often considered heretical or unorthodox. You are an absolute enemy of liberalism as you believe it to be false from the very beginning. Yet the reception of your ideas in the West and the East today is pretty good. In the sense, where do you see this American fabric inclining to? What are the major flaws that destabilized and weakened this structure? So I think uh, um, there is an inner an inherent, uh, inherent paradox in the liberalism. Liberalism was liberal uh, when he was confronted with two totalitarian uh, political ideologies, with communism that was totalitarian, and with fascism that was as well purely totalitarian. And comparing with them, liberalism was liberal and that was the might and the power. But when there were, uh, there were no anymore, uh, neither fascism nor communism, the liberal was uh, uh, left alone. And now we see that the, the precisely the victory of the liberalism opens its inner nihilism embedded in it. And now liberals behave themselves as fascists or communists. They impose on their values. They declare Manichaean war against all kinds of the people uh, who don't agree with them. And my example is just a sign of that because I am not liberal. I have no right to use Google uh, email, to have account on YouTube, to, uh, to buy or to sell my books uh, on Amazon and to have my Twitter. And they try to censor, to cancel, to deplatform everything that is not liberal. And that is the paradox of the liberalism. So when liberalism becomes totalitarian, illiberal in itself, when the individual, that was a kind of goal uh, of the liber uh, liberals uh, historically, is achieved and now is split uh, and is transformed in the post-human, post-cybers uh, uh, and uh, artificial intelligence. So the victory of the liberalism, historical victory, that was defeat. Not uh, uh, liberalism um, was defeated by alternative, but liberalism was uh, defeated by itself. It was. It is not explosion. It's implosion of the liberalism, and we, we are witnesses of that. We observe that, and that explains their fear about the people who are against that. And I would say that in spite of all that, my audience, including in the United States, in the Europe, uh, in, uh, and as well as out, uh, outside of Europe, is growing and not narrowing. So it is uh, expanding in spite of all totalitarian uh, repressions that, that I, uh, uh, I, am, I am go off. So I think that 
uh, the liberals uh, will be defeated by themselves and they could not stop, they could not make reality check. They are obsessed with more and more and more liberation, more and more and more individualism, more and more technical progress, and they kill themselves. That is the serpent that bites uh, its uh, uh, tails. And I think that the liberals, I, uh, now they, when there were communism and fascism, they could attack the other. There is no more other. There is only liberals. And they, uh, they uh, uh, are obliged to attack themselves. And the split in the United S uh, States of America, I, I, I think maybe there are two, I agree with Alistair, there are two to different wing, more and more radical in this American society, and this new Leninism kind of, kind of um, ultra uh, far left, far left liberals, as Trump has uh, called them, and there are right wing, obviously, but. All that is this inner split. The problem is, is uh, in, liberal, in liberalism. There is no other. When they say, oh, Putin or uh, Muslims or Erdogan or China uh, is responsible for all, 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 the, all the bad aspects. Not at all. Um, absolutely no, because that is the inner problem and inner disease of liberalism. And the, 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 the most critical point for liberals is when they uh, win when they win precisely. So maybe the, the victory of Biden will, the, will be the last, if it uh, happened. If he succeeds. Yes, it will be, uh, be because Trump saves. He, he, he is saving something that is still uh, is to save uh, in Western society with such uh, radical, radical maniac as uh, Biden and the people around him. They, they will go further and they will... So it seems from, from your tone, uh, Alexander, that you are pro-Trump. Yes, morally I am in favor because uh, in, in, in Evangel, uh, in our Bible, is written uh, that perversion should, has to come in the world, but not through you, not through yourself. So I could not be pro Biden. I, I am at least for the lesser of the evil for for Trump. Right. I'm always against the the worst happen. So I am pro Trump. But but if Biden comes, maybe it will be sooner. The the end of the liberal system uh, will arrive sooner. But that uh, don't it doesn't exclude possibility or probability probability of the war a world war and that is very dangerous so right. dying they call they they can kill the other mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, alistair allow me here um, is liberalism in the process of defeating itself and i would like you to ask you something also important that uh, biden attacks Trump's rushed and unprecedented confirmation of Amy Barrett as Supreme Court Justice. Well, Barrett is a constitutional originalist opposed to revisionism and a devout Catholic. She's a conservative. Trampled institutional norms, a battle over the Supreme Court and the possibility of democratic retaliation could threaten the bedrock of American democracy. How is this? casting its effect on the current inclinations and consequently on the election race, in your opinion, Alistair? Uh, well, I think um, it was well described by the person that called liberalism as the god that failed, because it was always an illusion. It mm -hmm. was a sort of a false god that was put out there that would, and it had its roots in West Christian um, if you like Christianity, that this was going to lead to redemption and this was in a linear plane of progress. But I think it's obvious now that this is um, uh, coming apart and uh, destroying itself, uh, 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 as uh, Professor Dugan has said. But I think um, well, what is more is that actually globally we need a catharsis. This structure that we've had, this struggle that we've had since the end of the two great wars. Um, it needs a catharsis. It's become rotten internally. And I think we haven't mentioned it so far, but the one thing that this um, coronavirus has done 
um, perhaps it's changed the world more fundamentally than many elements of politics, how we live, how we work, etc. But what it's done is expose the fractures that were always there. It didn't cause this, but it's exposed it and shown them to be false. And I think um, we have to go through this catharsis and it will be turbulent and will not be very pleasant for many of us in many different ways. Um, and there will be victims, but this is something that is inevitable and is coming. We're going to go through huge changes. Mm -hmm. And I just want to add, not just in the United States, because all of these, if you like, elements are present in Europe too. And the connection between all these events that are taking place now, future of Europe, hangs on what is the outcome in the United States. Sure. Because Europe is trying to move to a new reality, uh, a new, if you like, great reset of itself. And very much that hangs on what happens in, in the United States. But, you know, catharsis can be good. It'll not always be pleasant, but it is inevitable and necessary, I believe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh Dr. Dugan, how Americans' distrust of each other and for anyone other than themselves being an empire has impacted more widely on the geopolitical order and on perceptions of the proper management of economies, which in this case, Russia and China are drawn from the experience of earlier convulsions of their own. So um, economical, uh, economical order that we are um, living uh, in is as well has two level. So all the global economy is liberal, is based on the market society, market um, with example, with exception of North, Northern Korea, every other society, including all uh, Chinese, Chinese society, Russian society, Muslim society, they all, all of them all of us accept uh, economical system, but there are two to to speed uh, and two direction of this economical development and new economy based on finance, based on uh, high technology, based on cyber uh, processes, is uh, uh, replacing very uh, on the big speed traditional industrial uh, economy. So. Uh, uh, um, traditional uh, capitalism is replaced by, by, by turbo capitalism, as um, they they call uh, that. Uh, so, uh, and that uh, turbo capitalism is has totally different different um, point of, of, of the growth. That is financial market, that hedge funds, that is economy almost totally totally outside of the industrial amount of the goods produced on, uh, and sold and so on. So that is a kind of cyber uh, virtual economy that um, uh, that uh, um, uh, that um, take uh, uh, over uh, uh, on all the other traditional way. And I think that we see precisely in the uh, flyover zone in the United States and they cross Trump position. That is reaction of the uh, old or traditional uh, market liberal economy and the coastal area. They represent this new uh, Wall Street financial sector, uh, high technology. So that is two to uh, aspect, to level of uh, liberal economy that is uh, uh, in, in, in com uh, competition and maybe in, in the fight, in the war. Th that is the civil war be be between two kinds of economical, uh, uh, economical tendencies inside of the capitalism and liberalism. And when we regard, when we observe that from Russian point of view, from China and Chinese po point of view, we are in a passive position. We should um, 
we, we have only one uh, solution to follow somehow both of this tendency. But what is important, the problem is not uh, uh, how, uh, how uh, far we are, are behind the, the West or the United States. So the problem now is in, in the, those who are uh, in front of all the other. And Russia and China just take uh, the moment, the situation, with this crisis in the center of global capitalist system, with this fight in, in the United States, Russia and China um, have the chance to reaffirm their sovereignty and their independence as well in economical level. But almost nobody thinks in that direction in Russia just trying to get some geopolitical um, profits from this situation and to reaffirm Russia as independent, independent um, strategical pole. And China is much more carefully att and attentive to, to this change. It's trying to play both e uh, traditional economy and uh, high-end economy, new economy, and financial sector. And that is why uh, uh, Trump is so anti-Chinese, because he considers more economical level. And that is the real competition, because with TikTok and the other things, Chinese compete re really with this uh, cyber, uh, cyber uh, economy, with uh, and this uh, turbo capitalism. And they have learned the lesson of this. Um, high-end technology. That, that is why they represent uh, the real threat for the United States and not Russia. Uh, Dr. Dugan, uh, Chris Paul is asking, didn't globalism destroy the liberalism of Adam Smith? So uh, that is idea of, of Chris. Uh, I know him very well. He's very, very uh, good uh, intellectual from uh, Britain, uh, and I appreciate his his vision. He is old school liberal, so he thinks that there is good liberalism, uh, uh, original Adam Smith liberalism, and there is new liberalism that is total perversion of initial liberalism. I respect this position, and that proves to be somehow confirmed by what we see in the United States, because in the United States it is not the fight between liberalism and illiberalism, that is the it's split inside of liberalism. So, but um, my analysis, uh, my genealogy of um, the construction of liberalism uh, has led me to a little bit different, different opinion, but I would to enter in the detail, but but it's, uh, in any sense, I I um, respect very much uh, ideas and position of my of friend Chris Paul. Of course, sure, we all do. Uh, Alistair, you have written about secular millenarianism, the belief that some transformative catharsis in history has the power to expunge the crimes and follies of the past which has a long and bloody history, this secular millenarianism. The notion originally owes to religion, theories of human progress as an upward trending linear continuum, inevitably leading to a better human end. Though clothed today as technological miracles were never empirical hypotheses. They were always concocted myths answering to a human need for meaning yet manipulated ruthlessly in the interest of power. But what is quite odd, Alistair, is what are such myths doing in a modern US presidential election today? Very, very pertinent question. And, you know, we have to look at how it happened. But it's very obvious because if you ask the, those who are on the streets, the wokes, the BLM, you know, what is their platform? What sort of society do they want? Where do they want to see America in the future? Um, they don't have an answer to this because um, they talk in it um, about simply in terms of this innate racism, innate oppression, um, the failure of the whole principles of the United States. And you say, so what do you want to do? And they don't have an answer because we go back to the millenarianism because they say, we want to burn it all down. And then, of course, they don't say, 
you know, the divine will then help us create the new society. And I've been at meetings in the Middle East where people used to say that very much. They said, <laughs> you know, gosh, you made, a, you, know, you made a mistake. You tried to deal with the West and uh, become involved in the politics, but really we just got to burn the system down. And they used to say, look, Islam will take care of it. It will just rise and the structure will emerge because of the natural dynamics and impulse of Islam in a freed situation will create the new world, the new, if you like, um, uh, redeemed world. And that's what the wokes are saying. It's the same thing. It's very similar. They're very secular. They don't attribute it to religion, but they're basically saying when we burn it down, justice, social justice, equality, all of these things will emerge out of the out of the ground out of the system and we will enter into a new paradise if you like of the united states and this is why it's you know the this combined with the sense of wanting to cut cancel everyone else to, to contest it is why it's it's so dangerous it's like if you like in you know the i'm talking to you from italy but like in that period burning of the books and now you hear, I mean, quite clearly, and the same language comes again. Um, uh, when a recent author made a comment about whether the women were women, um, what was the language they used? They said, burn the witch, burn the witch. And people are also talking about lining people up for the firing squad. We must clear the oppression, the people who support Trump. We must remove them. They must be eliminated. Mm -hmm. It's shades of what would happen in Russia in the 1860s with a generation that had also from really well-to-do middle class who became so radicalized um, that they were ready to throw nail bombs into the cafes in Russia in order to watch the bourgeoisie in their death agonies. These, this is the sort of uh, uh, the danger. I'm not saying that all of the people on that side are like that, but there is this current within it, which is very different. And I just want to say, I mean, the whole th situation is being prepared for violence. Um, there's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. How much it is, whether it really happens, is different. The election is being set up by the press and by polling and everything else to say the elections already happened, Biden won, and anyone who says he didn't win is lying and is a traitor. Um, and then to put millions on the street so that the decision of the uh, election is not in the Supreme Court, not in the US Congress, but is it's going free? to be just decided in the street. Mm -hmm. and, and people will go and defend themselves against that, I suspect. How, how, whether it will actually come to that, but there certainly are millions being prepared to go on the street um, uh, on the day after the election, if there's any attempt to declare that Trump won in the electoral college enough votes to be uh, within uh, a striking range of um, becoming president. Alistair, so what, is, what, what is taking place today in the US of A with this election, is it so, different uh, from previous elections? Why is everyone's eye on this elections in the US uh, today? Everyone's eye because as I say, it, it people feel that their way of living, their way of being, the values that they've built their life will be completely destroyed mm -hmm. if the opposition wins. And they're fighting for their way of life, for their families, for whatever it is on both sides. They're fighting for what they see to be, you know, com incompatible ways of life. This is, you know, this is why, and they are convinced that they have, will have the majority. And if anyone says they haven't got the majority, then it's because the election has been rigged. gerrymandered and rigged mm -hmm. in someone's favor. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a, a complicated exercise. Mm -hmm. But what it means also is because the only thing that really holds America together more than anything else, because it's a very diverse people, diverse backgrounds come in from different parts, has been the idea of process, that there was some system for the transfer of power. 
there was some system by which power could move from one person, from one president um, uh, to another. Once that is now seen to be illegitimate and inappropriate, whether it's the uh, College of Electors or the Supreme Court being rigged by Trump or whatever it is, then when they don't believe that there is any element for the succession of power, you really go back to, to Rome in the, in the sort of early part of the Christian era, when the only way, when that happened in Rome, the only way to remove the emperor was to kill him. Mm -hmm. That was the only way, because there was no, if you like, process by which you could move from one side uh, to the other. And that's what happened. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, you know, that process. And the other thing that the Americans believe in is, apart from the Constitution, is the military. Mm -hmm. And the military are sworn to the Constitution. But now we see the US military, many of them saying, well, there are other values that are more important, perhaps even than the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And even today, I'm not quite sure where um, the military leadership, at least, mm -hmm. will stand. If Depending on, the, yeah, on how this Constitution is going to be interpreted and by whom. Yes. Um, exactly. Alexander, um, an observer notes that what is going on in the USA is, of course, classic color revolution management okay. of mass psychology, albeit perpetrated from within the US this time against its own incumbent President Trump. What's your sense? So uh, I think that is a correct remark because um, now, but what, what is absolutely new, I think, in the situation that we uh, observed that the West, generally, United States, the West, the, some special services of the West and ideologists, they used to use a color revolution against the regimes they were against them. So they demonized uh, these regimes uh, politically, uh, uh, in um, uh, informational uh, sphere, in mass media. And after that, that fu they fueled a uh, kind of pop uh, popular protest movements as in Venezuela, in Belarus, in Georgia, every almost everywhere in the Arab world. Our Arab Spring was the same kind of color Color, uh, color revolution, uh, and we had the image that it is about one subject, the globalist West, who attack regime or societies that do, they don't like, that they try to replace by other more uh, in favor of the West. But now we see for the first time, they use the same strategy of the color revolution inside of American society against the men who don't like, uh, who they don't like. But that is the question, who are they? Before we thought, we imagined that is, there is the West, there is a uh, globalist uh, Western elite. And, uh, and the United States as America as just instrument or the part of it, or maybe the center of it. Uh, but now we see that the problem is should be put differently because they use the same weapon against the, the part of their own system. So who are they? Uh, uh, Trump called, they, called them the swamp. Not Americans, not the West, not liberals, not capitalist elite. They call them with special name, the swamp, and the swamp answer, yes, I will destroy you, Trump. I am the swamp. And what we see now with color revolution or civil war in the United States with this election is much more than elections, I think, that the swamp becomes clear figure, a kind of gestalt, a kind of uh, the person and subject. And that doesn't, uh, uh, this subject doesn't coincide anymore with the United States or with the West in general. So we need 
to re, re, rethink or, or redefine the main line of the opposition because they were the, the, the West globalist against the rest. And now the West is split because in the West is the West, Trump and he is the West. He is the president of the United States of America that can manage to stay four years or awful, terrible years as the, against impeachment. He wasn't impeached. He, he wasn't destroyed. He wasn't killed. He is um, powerful president of United States of America, the firm, number one democracy. So there is the, the, the people, the part of the society of the West who is in favor of that. He support that. So and they use they this one uses. Uh, the same uh, strategy, the same weapon, the same, the same methods against him. So mm -hmm. that is the main, main result, much, much deeper and much more important than the result of the elections themselves. Sure. So there is something that transcends that. So there is the inner split of the West. There is no more the West. So when we say, say when, we, when we say the West, we should define Trump's West or Biden's West. And liberals say, oh, there is only Biden's West or only Obama's West, only neoconservative or neo-democrats West. There are two Wests. And after, now we are obliged to make this distinction. That is existential, metaphysical distinction. And that is very, very important. Uh, news and very important uh, philosophical and result of this present situation that affect every one of us, every, everyone. So colored revolution uh, orientated and used against the Western uh, uh, legally elected president that unprecedented. That is something that is, that is the end of well, the Well, they have long used their color revolutions everywhere against also uh, constitutionally elected presidents elsewhere. And now that it's being used against Trump, which is an, as you said, an incumbent uh, president. My question to um, Alistair, are there two Wests? Do you agree with uh, Professor Dugan? Oh, yes, mm -hmm. um, probably more than two, but I mean, definitely the, the major fraction. And um, Professor Dugan didn't identify them, and he called them the swamp, which is a, a broad definition. But actually, we know who they are because they were the ones we saw kneeling before Black Lives Matters. Uh, and they were some surprising uh, individuals and figures amongst that. So what is, um, what is this um, force, if you like, that is funding Black Lives Matters, funding people on the street? Uh, surprisingly, it's big philanthropy, Ford Foundations, the big foundations. It's also some of the CEOs of big um, corporations in the West. And it's also an element of what I call woke Wall Street. That is that part of Wall Street uh, that wants to see a great reset, that believes that uh, the American dollar hegemony, the American economic system cannot continue as it is for long, and they want to make a reset. Uh, this is what Davos is all about. This is what Europe is all about, so that they can be at the table as they were in Britain Woods long ago um, to define and, and look after their interests um, and not allow a financial crisis or an economic collapse to be the, if you like, the trigger uh, for a monetary reset. And, and so they are closely allied with um, with not only Davos, but also with um, Merkel and Macron and the, and the Europeans who also want to see it. And one of the reasons Trump is so against it is he knows that this whole plan is really about a transfer of power um, from the United States to Europe. Why Europe? Because Europe doesn't have a constitution. It doesn't have all of the separation of powers. You take a, an organization like the Eurogroup in, in, in the EU, that decides European policy on Greece, on Italy, on all of these things, on Brexit, it's not in any treaty. It doesn't answer to anyone. No one knows where its agenda comes from. No one knows how it actually operates, apart from those who are engaged in it. And, and so it's an ideal platform to move towards a, a sort of globalist um, form of governance. 
and towards what is the ultimate objective, uh, a central bank, central bank digital currency, mm -hmm. whereby there will be a new currency that will replace the dollar in due, in due course. So this is the big fight. And then there's parts of Wall Street and part of America with Trump who say, over my dead body, are we going to give up dollar hedge money? This is what American power depends on today. Mm -hmm. We're not going to allow it go, to go to the Europeans or to some central bank um, in, in Europe or somewhere else or to China. No, we are going to fight it. But the key point in which I, because we keep talking about two sides, but the key point in this is demography. Mm -hmm. If the Republicans lose this election, then they will probably never be able to recuperate the power again, their culture, the, if you like, a conservative Christian culture, Catholic or an evangelical or whatever you like, will then be eliminated by a Supreme Court that will be packed out and will pass legislation that will involve lawsuits that will destroy their institutions, their social structures, and change it um, uh, radically. radically. So it's yes. really an existential issue for, but, if you like, that section of the American population. There won't be another chance yeah. they, because there won't yeah. because the Democrats will open the doors to immigration and the they will not be able to win another election. From your most recent updated uh, following up with what's going on on the ground, Alistair, do you think that uh, this is the end of the GOP? This is going to be the end of the GOP. What's oh, your no. speculation? Oh no, it's far too early to 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 make that assessment because, um, first of all, as I said to you, all the polls are, are partly there to try and convey the impression that the the election has already been won by Biden uh, and that it's quite clear and that if anyone says otherwise, it, it it's gerrymandering. But that's not the case because there are also some countervailing um, effects on, uh, that one can see on the ground. Um, in the swing states, which are going to be the key states, there are about five swing states, so-called, because they will determine the electoral college outcome in that. Um, but actually what we see is over this period, the Republicans have really been on the ground, doing that hard slog of going around houses, getting voter registrations out. Mm -hmm. And in many cases now, in these swing states where they used to be far behind, the Republicans are either uh, ahead or within spitting distance of the Democrats. The Democrats are relying more on sort of high cost advertising. And some people um, but the Republicans are not expressing got their uh, some people are not expressing vocally their attitude or what they're going to, or who are they going to vote for, uh, just in case they don't want to be ostracized. Hey, it's not ostracized. They don't want their windows broken. They don't want sure. to be attacked in the street. They don't want to be um, spat on or something. It's it's not pleasant. And, and, and this is why the big city centers are, are emptying. I mean, people, and they keep saying to me, you know, they're frightened. They're frightened for their children to go out and things. They say the wrong things. They stop their car at a traffic light. Someone breaks the window because they suspect they might be Trump supporters or 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 or, or, or whatever. So, you know, the it, it, it's um, uh, the, it, as I say, people are not going to disclose to a polling organization. I, I spoke to a person about it the other day. He said, look, I can't put a sign up. He says, I can't put any sign up saying I support Trump. I'd have every window broken within an hour. But he says, you know, I'm fine. I'm going to vote for Trump and I'm not worried. I have 16 guns in the house. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, I don't know why he needed 16. Mm -hmm. One I thought would be enough, but anyway. Yes. That's America. Briefly, allow me to ask you, Alistair, why is the confidence in the American paradigm in a precipitous decline? Uh, well, I, I mean, some of it uh, Professor Dugan has touched on, but actually it's consumed itself. I mean, there is no sense. I mean, where is liberal capitalism? There are no liberal markets left. There are no markets that are functioning. They're all organized by the Federal Reserve and the Treasury and their subsidies 
and who they dictate they're going to support or not support. Um, there, uh, there is no, if you like, economic um, process, monetary. And even um, the, the, the idea of American corporations has been shown to be so wanting in this coronavirus time, because actually it turned out that all of these big corporations couldn't even produce a packet of Panadol or a mask to wear or gloves to wear because they'd all spent their, their uh, investment dollars on, on the most profitable, only the top end high, most profitable medicine, you know, plastic surgery, replacement hips, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, um, and they didn't even have the very basics of medicine available. And this is true of much of it. These corporations um, offshore the jobs, they have now um, only um, focused on margin, the highest margin activities, and they don't deal with the day-to-day -day or at least the least profitable, less profitable aspects of it. So I think there's a real sense that mm -hmm. the economy is not working. Let me put it this way. What is the difference today between the American economy and that of China? Mm -hmm. I think it's only one of degree. The economy in America is entirely decided by the Treasury Secretary, Moon Hyun, and, and the Federal Reserve Powell, who decide through a hedge fund who gets what money, who doesn't get what money, and the oligarchs who control um, the, the system. There's no real sense of a, of a functioning economy. And it's keeping going by these huge in, influx of, of liquidity, so-called, but of um, printed money, printed out of nothing that is being injected into the American economy to keep the stock market up. Mm -hmm. But for how long will it keep up? And what happens then? Even the stock market traders are really don't know the answer to that. And they know it must come at some point, right. but they don't know. Right. Uh, Alexander, have you had a sense of such transformations and crises before? Or uh, thanks to COVID-19, matters just came to the surface more today? So I don't, I don't think that the uh, pandemia or epidemic situation uh, is the real cause for that. No, it just helped to, to, to some th things to be more clearly manifested. So it is not the cause. It's just one, uh, one of the process that uh, uh, helped to, to see uh, where we are and uh, uh, where are, uh, are we going. But I think that uh, that, that is uh, uh, always very, very difficult situation comparison between different uh, different historical situations because there are something similar, something dissimilar totally. So uh, I think that um, now it is something global because the West, has won at certain point of the history the role to represent the humanity. That was the, the victory of anthropology. So the Western man is the man. Is what is human? Let Western European de de decide what is the human. Who is the human? Who is subhuman? Who is, who is in, the, in the process to to be uh, human? First of all, that was cultural uh, race in, uh, based on the races uh, and after that now is the economical or, or social and so on but there is always decision makers of what is human in the hand of, of, of the West and now uh, uh, that was manifested by the victory of modernity and three political ideologies of, of modernity, the fight between these three political ideologies during 20th century and the victory was uh, uh, was uh, on the side of the liberals that are representative of, of all the West, all modernity, all uh, all the humanity, because all the humanity is the kind of periphery of, of the West. And now the problem is with them. So the crisis we, we live through, it is the crisis of everything somehow, because every all alternative 
in the eyes of liberalism and all who follow somehow a, a, a liberal ideology, a liberal idea, uh, all alternatives are overcome already. So they represent just the rest of, of the past. So there could not be uh, uh, alternative to liberalism and all the enemies of open society, according to Karl Popper, are defeated. So there is no more fascist fascist nor communist so they are fighting liberals are fighting with the shadows with the kind of uh, simulacra uh, of uh, old already defeated enemies and finally they exclude the possibility of alternative that is why they uh, uh, they uh, uh, identify the term illiberal to be fascist or communist so you cannot to be a liberal, you cannot to be a liberal. It is prohibited. So you will you will pay to be a liberal. So that is totalitarian approach, and everybody should uh, 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 should accept that. But what we see in the center of this system, there is the growing void, growing nihilism, as uh, Lester Crook has said. Uh, there is the void. There is emptiness. That is growing, as dessert in the famous phrase of Nietzsche. Dessert is growing, uh, and sorrow will, will be on that who uh, uh, is the bearer uh, of the uh, dessert. So th that is dessert inside of liberal situation. That is the huge, uh, huge catastrophe, a huge crisis of all the humanity, because right. there could not be alternative. So liberals could not recognize any alternative. And if there is no alternative, there is no liberty, there is no freedom. And th th that is the kind of totalitarian shift or totalitarian turn in the uh, liberalism. But that is not about them. It is about us because we are all liberals somehow. We are living in the liberal system with liberal market, with liberal culture, with, with liberal ideology, with the progressism, with technology, with materialism, with all liberal, liberalism is in sight. So when we uh, observe what is going on in the United States, we observe somehow, we observe somehow what is going inside of us, inside, that is about all of us. And we, because we are not alternative, we, we just, we just uh, uh, manifest some, uh, some concern with what is going on. We, we are bothered with that. We are not happy. We, we are not sure. And that is enough to, to call us more dangerous uh, uh, thinkers uh, in the world. We, we're just asking, oh, 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 where are you going? We're just trying to understand. In our eyes, it is abyss. So please stop, we say. Ah, they say, you are fascist. Let's, mm -hmm. let's go further. Yes. Heretical so, and unorthodox ideas as they always try to define your ideas, uh, Dr. Dugan, but uh, of course we disagree with them. Um, in talking about elections, my last question was going to be directed to uh, both of you, uh, Alexander and Alistair, please. In talking about elections and all the fantasies that come along, well, um, assertions are being thrown about Russian, Chinese, and Iranian uh, interference in the polls. They are untrue. These states are doing the exact opposite, but the lies will have serious geopolitical consequences. They cannot be brushed aside in the election's wake. Who in America has rebutted them still? How would their leaders engage with the US after such besmirching without dishonoring themselves wholly before their own people? How to do business with a state in which officials are so partisan and who lie so freely? The answer is they won't. Have China and Russia and Iran to a lesser extent reached their, we have had enough moment. Alistair. Yes, they have. Mm -hmm. uh, I think. What next? One of the. I'm coming, but one of the things that is quite striking about this period and points to the sort of nihilism that uh, Professor Dugan has been talking about is the extraordinary way that um, the establishment can produce a lie 
that everyone knows is a lie and everyone knows everyone knows it's a lie, yet it still has to have the same currency and go on as if it was true. I mean, something like the poisoning of Navalny, mm -hmm. which is obviously a sort of intelligence service setup, is sort of accepted and reproduced by the newspapers, is agreed by the European leaders, even though they know it's not true. And we've had that with other things. How is it we've got to this point where it's just such a, you know, that even the most barefaced lies become, if you like, accepted and you can do nothing about them. But I think this is true. And where, what does it mean, what you say? I think that actually China and Russia in their speeches last week divorced from Europe, the European Union. They took it and they said almost entirely, you know, I don't think there's any point. What's the point of talking with you? And I think that the um, upshot of this is that we're going to see a division into three spheres. I think we're going to see Russia and China and the Belt and Road states largely with their own tech sphere, with their own regulatory and with their own, if you like, standards, technical standards. Europe is going to try and create its own and become a more forceful, if you like, center empire between the two elements. Um, but it lacks many of the means to do that. It doesn't have those technology, it doesn't have the advantages of China. And then we will have America trying to recuperate and insist on its standards being enforced for this next decade. I think this is the consequence of this uh, breakup. I think we are going to see a geopolitical war about standards, about regulation, about technology, who has 5G, who doesn't have 5G, and maybe even a hot war with China. Mm -hmm. Let's hope not. But that is a, a possibility because always, you know, when something major starts to go down, it tries to take others with it. Like a drowning person in the sea, they reach out to the very people who are trying to rescue them. I'm a diving instructor, at least was in the past, and you always had to be very aware of it, that you know, people who are going down can take the world down with them. And that's the great danger here, that they mm -hmm. try that they take the world down with them in their death agonies mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of the system. Sure. Uh, thank you, Alistair. Uh, Alexander, have China and Russia divorced from Europe and uh, have they reached their we have had enough moment? So uh, I, I could not say uh, uh, definitively that, that, uh, the, that the divorce is already uh, made uh, irreversibly because Russian elite, political elite is very, very Western, very liberal. So, and we have no alternative world vision uh, comparing with uh, Western and in front of the China, we are the West, uh, for example. And that is, that is wrong, that is bad, but that is so. Because uh, uh, Russia, uh, China, yes, China is civilization. That is full scale polar of multipolar world, full scale as uh, the uh, United States. But Russia uh, with Putin uh, plays the partly strategically military uh, the, the, the role of this other pole. And, uh, but uh, uh, being taught, uh, always repressed, uh, attacked, uh, uh, from all, all uh, accused to middle in the elections uh, before a hand. So we are already already responsible for meddling American elections before elections. So and if you say, oh no, Russian maybe will not interfere, you will be exactly uh, qualified as fascist in United States. That is, that is a lie, as uh, uh, Lister has said, a lie that transcend all the all the all the all the limits, all the possible limits. It is hyper lie, and they believe in that. You have no right not believe in they lie, and that uh, is uh, really dangerous. That is um, sinking uh, unipolarity. That can destroy emerging multipolarity. But uh, I think that multipolarity manifests 
itself more and more clearly. Each path, each step, each, uh, each tendency with regard, all the tendency uh, converge with the emergence of multipolarity. And there are two poles, more ready than other, the Chinese pole and Russian pole. Uh, two poles, very um, asymmetric, because Russia is giant military and strategically and dwarf economically, al almost dwarf. And China is giant economically and not dwarf at all, but uh, not so, so much as Russia and the uh, Russian nuclear power. Uh, and I agree there will be, there will be multipolarity mm -hmm. uh, if uh, Unipolarity in agony, agonizing unipolarity uh, that will not destroy the world because that is uh, wounded dragon, unipolarity, the swamp, this financial system that once I agree reset, they could decide, maybe they could decide to, to sacrifice all the humanity in order not to let alternative world order, multipolar order, world order to appear. So we are on, on this very dangerous, dangerous edge, dangerous uh, uh, line uh, of the future and everything could happen. Uh, but I think that uh, unipolarity with, with Trump could, could theoretic, theoretically mm. peacefully give uh, the other poles the right to exist. And with Biden, they will go to the last, uh, last uh, um, step and the last uh, okay. limit of their hegemony. They, they, they can use all the, uh, all the uh, methods, all the weapons, and that is really dangerous. That is why Biden is the death. Mm -hmm. the, Biden is the greatest danger we, we have now because it is a uh, unipolarity in agony. And Trump could accept multipolarity if uh, America will be recognized one, uh, poll number one. Okay, no problem. We agree with that. Uh, Russians uh, and Chinese, we agree. L let be uh, poll number one, but not only one. You will be well, the better, the highest, the, the strongest between us three. And uh, our, we, we would promote the status of the poll to the other, to the Muslims, to the Iran, to Turkey, to to Europe, maybe to Africa, to Latin yeah, America, Pakistan. Sure, sure. Um, that said, uh, Alexander Dugan, a Russian philosopher, political analyst, theorist, strategist, and founder of the Fourth Political Theory. Thank you very much for joining us from Moscow. And Alistair Cook, British diplomat, founder and director of Conflicts Forum and former ranking figure in European Union diplomacy. Also, thank you very much, Alistair, for joining us from Rome. Thank you, dear guests, for your deep and sharp insights and see you in a future discussion on this platform. Thank you, Zeta. Thank you. Well, always welcome. A final note from our part of the world, we stand in solidarity and it's a note to all the free people across the globe. We stand in solidarity with the Palestinian detainee Maher al-Akhras, who has been on a hunger strike. He has not eaten anything for the last three months to protest his detention without trial by the Israeli occupation. We say to the oppressors, you might take our lives and freedom, but you can never take our souls and spirits and resilience from all of us here, from me Zainab al-Safar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. <laughs>